Greetings, folks. Today, we're going to introduce the concept of capacitors and capacitance. So what is a capacitor? Basically, it's an energy storage device. It stores energy in an electric field. And it's constructed, very simply, out of a couple of plates, just a couple of conductive, in other words, metal plates, like so. So there's a certain area right, associated with the plate. There's a certain spacing distance. That's an insulator in between that we call a dielectric. I put a, a power supply on this. And we will develop a charge on these plates. So the energy is stored in this electric field. Now the unit for this for capacitance is called the farad, and we can define capacitance in terms of charge and voltage. So C is equal to Q over V. And one farad, and we use a capital F to abbreviate that, but one farad is equal to one coulomb per volt. Typical values for capacitors that we use. Uh, they range from picofarads, right, 10 to the minus 12th, um, nanofarads, microfarads. In some extreme cases, there are farad-sized capacitors. But most of the things that you'll see in electronic circuits are pico, nano, maybe micro, um, particularly for things like power supply filters. We'll see hundreds or possibly thousands of microfarads. In the industry, it's odd to refer to capacitors as millifarads. That's just one of these weird holdover things. People refer to a 2,000 microfarad capacitor rather than two millifarads. You know, just sort of a weird quirk, but that's the way it is. Okay, so if that's the fundamental definition, how do we talk about it in terms of its physical characteristics? Well, capacitance is equal to uh, the area that we have divided by the plate distance and times the characteristic of the dielectric, of the insulator. That characteristic is called permittivity. And we can look this up on a table. So we have permittivity times A over D, right? area over displacement, right? distance. So obviously, the larger the plates are, the more capacitance we're going to get. The closer the plates are, the more capacitance we're going to get. The higher the permittivity, the more capacitance we're going to get. Now that would make you think, well, if I want a lot of capacitance, I want these plates to be really, really close, and I want a large area and a high permittivity. Is that all there is to it? Not necessarily. First things first, let's take a look at permittivity. So we can find out from a table what sort of permittivities we're looking at. So this is um, page 263 in the text. Um, we have various materials and relative permittivity. So that when we say relative permittivity, it's relative to what it would be for air. Okay, so we just sort of see this as a multiplier. Um, we work our way up. We have a series of various kinds of plastics, you know, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, um, paper, mica, and then we have a series of uh, ceramics up here that have very, very high permittivities. And so you would think, okay, that's, I'll go with this, right? The really big values, hundreds, thousands, rather than that's, you know, two, two and a quarter and so forth. But there's a downside, right? Each one of these things has its pluses and minuses. Temperature, stability, leakage characteristics, things of this nature. A particularly important one is the dielectric strength, the breakdown strength. So here's another little table. We can find out what the breakdown strength is, right? Kilovolts per millimeter. So for air, it's 3,000 volts per millimeter. Um, for mica, it's 118. For diamond, it's 2,000 kilovolts per millimeter. Now you can guess that, you know, diamond dielectrics are kind of expensive. But there's, a, there's going to be a trade-off here. Because just because you have a high permittivity doesn't necessarily mean you have a high breakdown strength. Right? And it's the breakdown strength, breakdown strength that plays into the spacing D. Because the closer the plates get, 
the lower the voltage will be before we have an arc through. Okay, so unlike resistors that have a power rating, capacitors don't have a power rating, they have a voltage rating. How big is the voltage? Right, so for a given material, for a given dielectric, the closer those plates become, then the lower the voltage rating is, right? Because it's so many volts, kilovolts per distance, per millimeter, all right? So we have a, a trade-off here. You know, I could have something that has a really, really high permittivity, but maybe the breakdown strength isn't so good. So I have to, you know, expand out that plate spacing, right? And this leads into something we call volumetric efficiency, right? Volumetric efficiency basically means how many farads can I pack in a box? All right, so that has to do with the area and it has to do with the plate spacing. Now, very often we fold these things. We don't, we don't just have two flat plates, right? We have stacked plates, so it's more like, like this kind of a thing, okay? Or sometimes we roll them, you know, with uh, aluminum electrolytics, for example. It's more like a sandwich that's rolled up. But there's a definite trade-off going on here, okay? So unlike resistors, where there's only a handful of materials that typically we'll use for... Uh, for the, for the resistor, carbon film, metal film, things like that, you will find that there are a great number of dielectrics that we use for capacitors. And it's always a trade-off in terms of um, things like temperature stability, leakage current, you know, there's these other characteristics. Cost, obviously, is another one. So we have to sort of balance all these things, all right? Okay. Now that we have some idea of what's going on here, a lot of place area, very close place uh, plate spacing, we get a lot of capacitance. How do we deal with these in terms of uh, multiple units, put them in series and parallel? What about a uh, schematic symbol? Now, the schematic symbol is pretty straightforward. Two parallel plates. There's your schematic symbol. The only variation on this is uh, we might have something called a polarized capacitor that has to be put in the circuit in a certain orientation. This is common with aluminum electrolytic capacitors, large values that we use for things like power supply filtering. If you don't put them in the right way, you'll get a lot of leakage current and they may in fact explode. So not a good thing. But that's your basic symbol. Now, if you take two capacitors and you put them in parallel, Think about this for just a sec. What you're really doing is increasing the plate area, right? If you had two identical caps, you put them in plate uh, in parallel. It's like you've doubled the area. The distance is the same. The permittivity is the same. So you've doubled the capacitance. So caps in parallel add. In other words, like resistors in series do. Right? So if you had three, four, five, you just keep adding them up. On the other hand, if you put them in series, the analogy would be like increasing the plate spacing, right? So you get less capacitance when you do it this way. So this is treated the way resistors um, in parallel are treated. In other words, CT is one over. 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2, 1 over C3, and so on and so forth. Okay? All right. So that's the basic layout on this. Now, what about its current voltage characteristic? Well, we can't use Ohm's law. Ohm's law refers to a resistor. V is equal to I times R. What do we have for a capacitor? Well, the relationship is a little bit different. The, the standard textbook relationship is that the current flowing through the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the rate of change of voltage across the capacitor, dV dt. Now, the way I like to write this, I think it's a little bit more useful to write it as the rate of change of voltage, in other words, the slope of the voltage, right? What's it doing versus time? Is equal to the current divided by the capacitance. I think that's a more useful way to write this because what it shows Two things. First of all, if you have a constant current source, you're going to get a constant rate of change. In other words, you're going to get a ramp out of this thing. 
So if you just took a current source and you fed a capacitor, right, this current just feeds into this, and if you plot the voltage, then you just get a straight line out of it, right? It's a constant current, so dVdt is constant. You get a straight line. How steep is this straight line? Well, it depends on the value of the current, depends on the value of the capacitance. Big currents, small capacitors change very fast. Small currents, large capacitors, they change very slowly, but it's a straight line. In the real world, eventually you're going to run out of steam over here, right? This current source is going to be unable to produce the kind of voltage that we need. But for our idealization, this thing just goes forever. The second thing this tells you is that the voltage across the capacitor cannot change instantaneously. That's a huge thing. Right? VC, voltage across the cap, cannot change instantaneously. Why? Well, look at the equation. An instantaneous change means dv dt itself is instantaneous. It's infinite. In other words, it's straight up and down. That slope is infinite. Well, the only way you can get that is if you have an infinite current source. There is no such thing as an infinite current source. So vc cannot change instantaneously. And this has very important implications in circuit design. Okay, so for example, if we start with a circuit, very simple circuit, okay, that um, you know, just has a, a DC source here and maybe, let's say, a couple of resistors with a capacitor. Something like this, right? I'll just call this R1, R2, R3. So the power is off, right? No currents, no voltages, zip. Turn the power on. What happens? Well, initially, because the voltage across the cap can't change instantaneously, initially that cap must still be zero volts. Well, if you think about it, that means it looks like a short, right? So initially, cap looks like a short. So we have, as soon as we power it up, a circuit that looks like this. Here's the cap. I'm just going to put a little shorting bar in here. So initially, R2 and R3 are in parallel. This is the circuit we see for the initialization. Now what happens when we wait? Well, as we wait, current is actually going into the capacitor. So what does that mean? It means we're going to build up charge on those plates. Okay, according to this formula, we can figure out how fast it's going to do it, but it's going to build up charge on those plates. Now eventually, because let's face it, it's two conductors, two plates, with a dielectric, in other words, an insulator. This eventually looks like an open. We call that steady state. If we wait long enough, And how, how long is long enough? Depends on the circuit values. Could be nanoseconds, could be milliseconds, could be seconds. Right? For steady state, capacitor looks like an open. And now your original circuit looks like this. Right? So this is an open out here, which means R3 basically disappears and your circuit only has R2 and R1 left with the power supply. Completely different circuit, right? Initially, cap shorts, we see R2 in parallel with R3. We wait long enough, R3 disappears and it's just R1, R2. So if you were to monitor the voltage here to ground, we would see entirely different things, right? Because initially, the R2, R3 parallel combo is gonna produce a voltage that's smaller than when R3 disappears.
So we'll see a voltage here initially when we power up, and then it's going to rise up to some other value, basically dictated by that voltage divider ratio. Again, how long does it take to do that? What happens in between? What do the voltages look like? You know, if I were to plot it over time, what does it look like? Well, that's what we call an RC transient, and that's going to be the subject of another video.